one is invention. All right. So that's where we just finished. I can't see it. You can't see it? Can anybody else see it? I can see it. Yeah, I can see it on my screen. Robin, why don't you hop off and try to hop back on? Okay. Oh, there it goes. There it goes. Okay, good. All right. So here's where we are. Um, so earlier, just a minute ago, when we were up here, I was telling you, like for hydrogen and for these diatomic halogen molecules, when we add these to an alkene, it doesn't matter which hydrogen goes where. It doesn't matter which halogen atom goes where because it's, they're identical atoms that you're adding. So we're about to do something different. We're about to look at what happens when you add water. So um, before we do that, though, I need to explain a rule. There are some addition reactions in your textbook. So if you're choosing to read, well, you should all be choosing to read. Um, as you're reading through the chapter, there are some addition reactions that you're going to get to that we just did not cover in lecture. And I will tell you that as you read through the textbook, um, if there's something that you're like, we did not talk about this in the slides, then you don't need to read that. Okay. Um, so when you get to the section where it's talking about all these addition reactions, um, there's like hydrohalogenation and some stuff. We're not going to talk about those. We are going to talk about hydration. Okay. So that's going to be right here. But before we get to hydration, I need to explain a rule. Now this rule applies to other kinds of addition reactions, the kinds that we're just not going to get into, but it also applies to hydration. So that's why I need to talk about it. It's called Markovnikov's rule. All right. And I wish that was my last name. Actually, I don't. My last name used to be very, very simple before I got married. And then Anybody have a name like that? No, you have to like spell it out for everybody. Um, so Markovnikov's rule says this, in the addition of HX, okay, so what is HX? So if we're adding something to an alkene, X could be an electronegative atom. It, it could be oxygen, chlorine, bromine, or it could be an OH group. So that's not written on here. Oh, dang it. It could be an OH group, okay as well, because the oxygen is electronegative. If we're adding um, these to an alkene, we have a major and a minor product. So, so what, what it's saying here is things could add different ways. Different parts of what we're adding could go to the different carbons. And this is very technical, but it does matter. It especially matters in industry when people are trying to get it, create a certain product. Um, the major product is the one that's, oh, wow. The major product arises from the hydrogen attaching to the double bonded carbon that has the larger number of hydrogens bonded to it. I'm going to say that again. So for example, what we're going to look at in a minute is hydration. We're going to be adding a water molecule to an alkene. So water molecule, I'm going to draw it like this for the sake of what I'm talking about. We're going to have two parts to this water molecule, the hydrogen and the OH group. So one of these hydrogens is going to break off and we're going to have an OH group. This is the electronegative portion and this is just a hydrogen. The hydrogen will attach to the double bonded carbon that already has more hydrogens bonded to it. And the electronegative atom or here the electronegative group, the OH group, will attach to the carbon that has fewer hydrogens attached to it. So we need to practice for a minute identifying carbons that are more substituted and less substituted. Okay, what do I mean by that? A carbon that is more substituted means it's like a secondary or a tertiary or a quaternary versus just like a primary or maybe it has no carbons attached to it. Okay, so the hydrogen, the hydrogen portion of this water molecule is gonna be bonded, it's gonna go to the carbon that has, that's less substituted. And the OH portion is going to go to the carbon that's more substituted, okay? Um, and by the way, when we're talking about substituted groups, okay, there's a branched groups, substituent groups. They do not all have to be the same. They can be completely different, okay? And then my second note before we do some examples of identifying more and less substituted carbons is this. If the carbons in the double bonds have the same number of hydrogens bonded to them, you're like, one doesn't seem any more or less substituted than the other then you're not going to get a major and a minor product. All your product will be the same, OK? So we're going to identify what I'm calling unsymmetrically substituted carbons, OK? So for example, let's look at 
this first molecule down here in the bottom left corner. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to zoom in on these. Look look at this carbon. I'm gonna call this carbon one, and I'm gonna call this carbon two. Okay, for carbon one, when I look at what is branched off of carbon one, I've got a methyl group and a hydrogen. When I look at what's branched off of carbon two, I have two hydrogens. So which one is more substituted? Carbon one or carbon two? Would it be carbon two? The one that's more substituted is the one that has more carbon-carbon bonds. Oh, okay, so carbon one? Yep, so carbon one is gonna be more substituted. So if I'm adding water here, which way is water gonna bond? Well, the OH would be added here because it's, it's gonna go to the more substituted carbon. And the hydrogen is gonna go to the less substituted carbon. It's gonna say, which one has more guys that already look like me? I'm just gonna go here, okay? All right, so carbon one's more substitute, carbon two's less substitute, okay? Now let's look at this second molecule. We have this carbon right here, carbon one, Call it carbon one, call him carbon two. Which carbon one or two is more or less substituted? What would you say, which one's more substituted? What do y'all think? Two. Which one has more carbon carbon bonds? And you're just looking at what's bonded directly to your carbon. So Claire said two, anybody agree or disagree? Now, what you're thinking is, okay, the bonded group has more carbons in it. We don't care about the number of carbons. Remember, the, the, the substituted groups, we don't care what they are. We're just looking at the number of carbon-carbon bonds. I see, I see one, I'm doing a poor job here. I see one carbon-carbon bond. It's right there. Well, guess what? On this carbon, one carbon-carbon bond as well. So these are the same. There's not one that's more or less substituted. These are identical. So if we were to add water here, it doesn't matter where the OH goes and where the hydrogen goes. These are not unsymmetrical. Okay, so these are symmetrical. Um, so I'll just say doesn't matter how the OH and hydrogen bond. And when I say it doesn't matter, I just mean it doesn't matter which carbon, carbon one or carbon two. Does that make sense? Okay, so what about this right here? We've got two carbons here, carbon one and carbon two. Again, which one do you think is more substituted? Is that one symmetrical too? That one's symmetrical too. They each have one carbon carbon bond. So copy and paste. Doesn't matter how they add. Okay. And what about this last one right here? Would it be carbon two? We label this carbon one and carbon two. That is correct, Robin. Carbon two has more carbon-carbon bonds. It's got one there. It's got another one here. It has two carbon-carbon bonds. And we only have one carbon-carbon bond off this first carbon. So carbon two is more cement or is more substituted. So what that means, if we're adding water across this bond, the OH is gonna go here. And the hydrogen would go here. Now granted, uh, the the double bond should disappear when we add water and I can't erase that double bond. Okay, so what you're seeing right here is not exactly the correct product, but I am showing you how water is going to be added across the double bond. Okay, so you can identify now unsymmetrically substituted carbons. By the way, you should also be able to go through and say, okay, which of these molly is a really good exercise. If you want to practice more cis trans isomerization stuff, Make sure you understand it. If I erase all my scribbles, um, you should be able to look at these and tell me, okay, could I get a cis trans isomer from this, okay, um, for each of these? Or could I not get a cis trans isomer? So that would be really good practice to go back and do. But let's talk about hydration now. 
Okay. So alkenes, um, first off, when you have a hydration, of water, or a hydration reaction, all we're doing is we're adding water to an alkene molecule. And when this happens, um, you, you can't just throw water at it and get a reaction. You have to have a strong acid catalyst, okay? So there's our strong acid, sulfuric acid. It's the catalyst. See what I'm talking about? They write it above and below the arrow. That's not another reactant. That is, a, that is the catalyst. The catalyst is not actually being used. So you should not have SO4 or H2SO4 anywhere on the product side. This is not part of the reaction. It's just making the reaction happen fast or happen, okay? Um, what it makes is it makes an alcohol product. So you guys remember we talked about the functional group alcohols, okay? It's a carbon with an OH bonded to it. And that's what we get here. So the name is gonna change. We had ethylene over here. It's a two carbon double bonded um, compound, ethylene. Now we have ethyl alcohol, all right? Or, or what's the other word? How, how could we, um, some people might name it this way. Ethanol, because remember the name ending for an alcohol is OL. So instead of ethane, it would become ethanol, all right? Ethane being the, the alkane form. This is ethylene, but, but now it becomes ethanol, okay? Because it's an alcohol. So um, the, the thing I wanted to talk about, the reason why we had to spend so much time talking about this rule though, is because it, it follows Markovnikov's rule, okay? So you see here, your carbons are not unsymmetrically substituted. You just got all hydrogen. So it literally does not matter which carbon the hydrogen goes to and which one the OH goes to, okay? So they just picked one. Um, but now we're gonna do some practice, all right? What products would we get? Label them as the major and minor product if more than one is formed. Okay, so Jeff, this is a great question you could see on the exam, something similar to this, okay? <clears throat> um, so look at, here's your double bond. I'm gonna zoom in on these. You have to imagine, this is a line structure, so you have to imagine here's my carbon and I've got, I've got two bonds to carbon over here and I have another carbon, two bonds to hydrogen, all right? Draw this out if you want to separately in a way that, that looks a little clearer to you. So when we break up this water molecule as H and OH, which part is the hydrogen gonna go to and which is the alcohol gonna go to? which carbon, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and draw my ring. Uh, that part's not gonna change. Okay, this double bond's gonna go away. So I'm just gonna have a single bond here. I'm still gonna have this carbon. And how is this gonna add? Where is this hydrogen gonna go? Is it gonna be bonded right here? Or is it gonna be, we're actually gonna get two products, but we're just, one of them's gonna be major, the one that follows Markovnikov's rule. One of them's gonna be minor. So here are the two products you could get. You could bond the hydrogen here. You could. This is not what we said would happen. And then we could get um, CH2, right? And then the OH would be also bonded to this carbon. So it would be CH2OH. I'm not drawing the bond out, but this is the one way it could add. The hydrogen bonds to this carbon, the OH bonds to this carbon. This is not following Markovnikov's rule though, right? Because if we label this carbon one and carbon two, carbon one is the more substituted carbon. It's got a bond. This bond is a carbon-carbon bond, right? And this bond is a carbon-carbon bond. So it's more substituted. So we would expect the OH to go there. So this is gonna be the minor product. Now let's draw the major product. The major product is the same thing, but the other way around. So draw your ring. Draw this time, if, if, a, if a hydrogen adds here, it just goes from a CH2 to a CH3 group, okay? And the OH is gonna be added right here. Okay, this is the major product. This follows Markovnikov's rule. Okay. Anybody lost on what we just did? Okay. 
take some time. Let's let's try B right here. Write out the two products, the major and the minor one. You're going to add water across those bonds. The OH is going to go to one carbon from the double bond, and then the hydrogen is going to go the other one. And then tell me which one's the major and the minor product. I'm going to draw them out as well. You you work ahead of me though. Don't wait for me. Okay, you should have stuff that looks similar to this. I didn't draw in the hydrogen part because remember our line structures, you don't have to draw the hydrogen in, but you know that the hydrogen bonded to the opposite carbon from the double bond. Okay, if you drew it in, fine, but I also wanna kinda get you in the practice of simplifying structures as, as much as you can. So which one would be major and which one would be minor? What about this first one? The major product is when the OH portion bonds to the more substituted carbon. The minor product is the one where the OH group has bonded to the less substituted carbon. So which carbon over here was more substituted, which one was less substituted? Well, if we look at, we call this carbon one and we call this carbon two. Carbon one has one carbon carbon bond there Another carbon carbon bond there, another carbon carbon. So that is a tertiary. We could draw a three with a degree sign, tertiary carbon. Um, actually, if you consider the double bond, it's a quaternary. Um, I left that out. All four bonds are to carbons. So it's actually a quaternary carbon. Carbon two right here has one that we've already drawn, two, and then three. So it's a tertiary carbon. Okay, so the more substituted carbon is carbon one up here. So the OH should be bonded to that. So that's going to be the major product. Okay. Um, it doesn't matter where the line is connected, right? Like I have it connected to that same carbon, but it's in like a different spot. Oh, you drew it like up here? Yes. That's fine, as long as it's bonded to the right carbon. It's going to be weird if you draw it bonded into the ring like that. Don't do that. You just bond them outside the ring. Um, but as long as you have it bonded to the right carbon, that's what I care about, Cameron. You may have already said this. On the minor one, why did the OH go? Was that because of the double bond? So on the minor product, it's opposite. OK, so the on the major product, the OH bonds to the more substituted carbon right here. And this hydrogen bonded to the less substituted carbon. I just didn't draw the hydrogen in. Okay. On the minor product, the high the OH has bonded to the less substituted carbon here, and that hydrogen from the water, the other part of the water molecule, bonds right here. Oh, okay, I understand. Okay, sorry. Thank you. You're good, Abby. Okay. Do y'all feel comfortable doing problems where you're writing the major, the minor product? If I gave you something like this on the exam, could you handle that? Okay, practice it if you can don't. Try okay. Go ahead, Robin. I was going to see if we could try number three or C yeah. on our own and see if yeah. figure that out. I want you to draw the product for number three. That's great. Okay.
Okay, who's got it? I'm gonna start drawing some of this out. <clears throat> so that double bond has now become a single bond. Okay, so does the OH go there or there? What do y'all think? Are they the same concentration or substitution? They're the same, they're symmetrical. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if the OH goes here or here, you should get the same product or you'll get, you'll get both products in equal amounts, we should, I should say, okay? So then you draw all this again, but then switch the hydrogen and the OH group. You, and you'll get both products in equal amounts. So you're not gonna have a minor or a major product. So if a question like that's on the test, we would just write equal under both? Yeah. After drawing out both, switching, okay. Okay. All right, so that is it for alkenes and alkynes. And I know we didn't talk a whole lot about alkynes, which are the triple bonded, but they're gonna react the same way that alkenes do on all this stuff, okay? Markovnikov's rule would apply. So if you had a triple bond and you were adding things, uh, like water, if you're hydrating an alkyne, the OH group is gonna go to the more substituted carbon, hydrogen least substituted, they're gonna react all the same ways that alkenes would, okay? Make a note of that. Alkynes react the same way. They have the same properties as alkenes. So the last thing we're talk about today is aromatics. And to zoom out. Um, okay, so these are a class of compounds, six membered ring with alternating single and double bonds. And we talked about these yesterday when we introduced functional groups. Um, here's a very simple you can see there's an aromatic here, but it also has an aldehyde group on it, okay? Um, so that's why it's called benzaldehyde. It's a benzene ring plus an aldehyde group. So they kind of mush the two names of benzaldehyde. Um, so this is an aromatic that's responsible for the flavoring in all these things, okay? Uh, so cherry, a lot of times artificial flavorings, anybody use those when you like cook or bake or whatever? Almond extract, whatever. Um, I don't know if they have like, cherry or apple extract, that's weird, but um, benzaldehyde is the flavoring agent in a lot of those, okay? Um, but two things I'm eating today. Almonds, almonds are good. So um, we're gonna draw a picture of this. I meant to have this covered up, but I didn't. So C6H6, by the way, you're gonna find out there's two ways you could think to draw this. One way would be like this. Okay. Another way would be like this. So how do I know? You'll see how they're different. The placement of the double bonds within the ring. How do I know which one's right? They both look like an aromatic to me. And the answer is they are right, okay? Um, if you read the next statement out here, they're right because of something called resonance. Have you ever heard of resonance before? Maybe you've heard of it, you're just not sure what it is. If you've never heard of it though, resonance means that electrons can move. You, I mean, you should have learned that chemistry 101, electrons are always moving. We draw them in bonds as though they're sitting here nice and neat, stationary. They're never sitting there nice and neat. Okay, they're always moving. And, and because they're always moving, one of the properties that we get with molecules is resonance, okay? 
So these bonds can move around. They can, they can switch. These double bonds can be in that first picture and then they can switch to the, the carbons in the second picture and back. So the true structure of benzene, of a benzene molecule is what we call an average among two or more possible structures, okay? So sometimes you'll see benzene draw like this. And they'll just draw a circle in it, indicating that it's indicating the movement of those double bonds. Okay, that indicates resonance. Okay, so you'll sometimes see benzene draw like this. It's the same thing as if we draw it um, with our three double bonds. Now, if we try to react it, it's an it's an alkene at heart, right? It's double bonds. It's just a lot of double bonds. Um, so if it's an alkene at heart because it has double bonds, we would think it would react all the same way as an alkene. But in fact, when when you try when they tried all these reactions. They didn't get any products. It, no reaction would happen. Okay. Why is that? Well, benzene is really incredibly stable. Okay. Because of resonance. So that's why it doesn't react. It's super stable. There's a lot of stability within this aromatic ring. So aromatic compounds, um, they do not react the way alkenes do. So if I were to toss two reactants to you like this and say, write the product, you would literally tell me what the slides no reaction. Okay. Um, Okay, what about properties of aromatics? So by the way, we're not gonna get into every kind of aromatic you could possibly think of or create. Um, we're gonna talk about very simple aromatic compounds, okay? Um, so the properties of those is they're nonpolar. All you have is carbon and hydrogen. They're insoluble in water, just like alkenes and alkanes. They're volatile. What does that word mean, volatile? Anybody know what that word means? Does it mean they can be dangerous or? Dangerous no. to breathe in. So my, yeah. husband, my husband works with wood a lot and there's like certain finishing like polyurethanes and things you have to put on wood to like make it waterproof or protect it. And a lot of these compounds are volatile and I always get so mad at him if he's not like wearing a, a mask and everything because volatile compounds are things that become gases easily and you can breathe them in. Okay, so that's why you have to be careful around certain compounds um, that are volatile because we don't want to just be breathing in a bunch of um, organic compounds that are not natural to our body. So volatile and then flammable as well. All right. Um, now that's hydrocarbon aromatics, hydrocarbon, hydrogen carbon only. There can be aromatic compounds that have nitrogen or oxygen as part of the ring and not just carbon. Okay. So here's some examples. When we throw a nitrogen in our aromatic ring, we have a common name for it. Instead of a systematic name, this is just a common name. You just got to memorize it. It's called pyridine. Okay. When you have an aromatic ring like this bonded to another aromatic ring with a nitrogen there, an NH group actually, it's called indole. Um, and then this is an adenine ring. Okay. This probably looks familiar from like um, ATP DNA. Okay. Adenine triphosphate. Um, so know some of the names of those. And then what else about aromatics? There's some more common names as well. well here we go. So uh, when you have benzene rings with substituents, like branch groups off of them. So this is what we call mono substituted benzene. Um, we're going to use benzene as the parent name and um, you don't have to number it if it's just one group branched off. We're going to assume that the, the branching point, the, the group that's branched off, that that carbon it's branched off of is carbon number one. So you don't even have to number it. You just write the name and we know wherever it's branched. Um, I mean, because all these spots are identical on the ring, technically. It doesn't matter if we branch the, the bromine here or here or here, any of these carbons. It could be branched off any same compound. All right, so for example, if we do have a bromine, group that is branched off our aromatic. We just call it bromobenzene. We name the substituent and then we put the word benzene. Okay, if we have an ethyl group branched off, notice the name is ethyl benzene. Okay, um, NO2 is a nitro group. So we, we call NO2 nitro. Um, so that becomes nitrobenzene. It becomes more complicated when you have two substituents branched off your aromatic. Okay, so we call these disubstituted benzenes. A benzene with two branch groups attached to different carbons. 
So we're going to use benzene as the parent name unless it has a common name. And this is the part of organic chemistry that I mentioned yesterday. This is the part that even can be frustrating for me because like you learn a systematic way of naming things, but then there's all these common names. So like this table in the corner down here, the green one. Um, you need to know toluene and phenol and aniline. Um, we'll get to benzoic acid later probably, but for now those top three, especially no toluene, no phenol. No, you're going to see those when you go to do the back of the chapter practice problems you're going to see phenol, you're going to see aniline. So just memorize those top three, especially. I'll box them in right here, these. Okay. Um, so if we have two groups branched off our bending, um, we, we will number them certain ways. And instead of just numbering though, one and two, one and three, one and four, these are the only substitution patterns. You can have something branched off one and two, one and three or one and four. It's the only ways they can be spread out across the ring, right? If you're like, well, what if something's branched over here? Well, one, that's not a di-substituted benzene anymore. That's a tri-substituted. And we're not even gonna know how to name those. We're not gonna talk about that. The most difficult we're gonna talk about is the mono-substituted and the di-substituted. But technically, if it's bonded here and not here, that's still a one, three, okay? Um, so even if you were to flip it, it's still a one, three. So these are the three ways it can happen. And we, we have certain abbreviations, ortho, meta, and para that we use in place of writing out the numbering. So if things are attached in a one, two manner, we call this ortho and you just put an O, O for ortho. If it's attached in a one, three um, pattern, then it's meta, M for meta. If it's a one, four, four pattern, it's P for para. So we're gonna do some practice problems because this won't make sense until you practice it. And then again, benzene is just the parent name we use. So, um, oh, last thing, last thing. Uh, could you go back real fast? Oh yeah. Thank you. Yep. Um, last thing before we do some practice. If benzene itself is a substituted group on a parent compound, so like something that uh, like an alkane or an alkene, okay? Then we call this group the same way we call CH, a CH3 group a methyl group. We call an aromatic, a benzene, that's a substituted group, a phenyl group, okay? So just the same way we have, if we have a CH3 bonded to something that's branched off something, we, we call that a methyl group. This is a phenyl group, okay? All right, let's do some practice. So name or draw the structure for the following aromatic compounds. Um, actually, I didn't even address this. I want to look at this right here. So the reason, this is a great example of what I was just talking about. Um, you've got one, two, three, four, five, you got seven carbons here. So we call this compound heptane, but we have um, an aromatic branched off of this third carbon. So that's why they call it three phenyl because it's a phenyl group, just the same way you'd say like three methyl or three ethyl. Okay. If it was like an ethyl or methyl group. 3-phenylheptane. Does that make sense? All right. Um, now we're going to do some practice. Name or draw the structure of the following aromatic compounds. By the way, you are still alphabetizing the substituted groups. And like I mentioned earlier, NO2 is called a nitro group. Now, if there is a common name, we're going to use the common name. So let's see here. We've got an aromatic in the middle and then branched off of it we have an NH2 and we have what is this group right here this right here what is that is that an ethyl group ethyl is a two carbon substituent this is a three carbon substituent oh uh the propanol or not propanol but um, oh, cool okay propanol. but notice that it is bonded through the middle carbon so that makes it Isopropyl? Isopropyl. Okay, so this is isopropyl. And NH2, what is that? We haven't seen that. I want to go back and look at our three. Does it look like any of these structures up here? Aniline. Aniline. So we're just going to name that as aniline with a isopropyl substituent. Now, these are in what kind of pattern? Ortho, meta, or para? Now, remember, ortho is a 1, 2. Meta is 1, 3. Para is directly across from each other. 
So what does this look like? Ortho, meta, or para? Para. Yep. So we'll say P dash um, isopropyl um, aniline. So P means that they're attached in a para pattern, a one four substituted pattern. Um, isopropyl is is four carbons away from the the amino group and and but this all together the the benzene plus the NH2 is known as aniline so that's why we said P isopropyl aniline okay we're gonna do let's just pick two over here between a b c and d which ones do y'all want to do which one looks hard they all look hard why don't we just do we'll start with a We'll do A, and then we already did aniline, so let's do a different one. We'll either do B or D. Uh, so we'll just do, start with A. Try to draw this out. What we have, so we have M chloronitrobenzene. So the M stands for meta. So that tells you how these substituents are spaced around the ring. One group is a chloro group. This is just a Cl substituent. And then nitro, we said is NO2. So we, we have an NO2 also branched off of benzene. So first, let's draw benzene. Maybe the worst benzene I've ever drawn in my life. Okay, and then we gotta have the double alternating double bonds. Okay, there's benzene. So now you guys tell me what I should do. Um, you could draw uh, a line on one and three. Okay, because it's meta, right? So it doesn't matter which one's one. All the carbons are identical right now. So just pick a carbon, just pick a spot. I'm just gonna draw here. There's one, and so if that's one, this becomes three. Or this one could have been three over here, okay? But I, it doesn't matter. So there's one and three. So this is a meta pattern. Now what do I do? Do you need to add like the chlorine and the nitro group? Yep. And it doesn't matter which one goes where. So I'm just going to put the chlorine up there and the NO2 there. Okay. Now we're going to do O nitro toluene. What is toluene? So this one's A. Now let's do B. So toluene is a common name. Toluene is right here. It's a benzene with a methyl group attached. So let's just go ahead and draw that since I know that is the parent compound. Okay, here's toluene. Now it says O, so ortho. So I always have to go back and remember, okay, ortho is one, two, a one, two substitute pattern. So I'm gonna go one carbon over. Doesn't matter if you go up or down, does not matter. I'm just gonna go down. And I'm gonna now add a nitro group right here. If you go up and you draw the nitro group, if you drew the nitro group attached right up here, you'd still be correct. Okay, so that is aromatics. I got one more practice problem for us, and I think that's it for lecture content today. So let's name these. <clears throat> we have three benzenes. So I'm, actually, I'm just going to look at A. We got a benzene ring, we got an OH group, 
and we got a CH2, CH3. Now here's what you got to do. Since you know some of these have common names, you always need to check to make sure there's not the common name that you're supposed to write for one of these. So let's go back and look at our common names and see if OH or CH2, CH3 is one of those compounds that I told you to memorize. What do y'all think? I don't see the ethyl group anywhere. Is it phenol? Mm -hmm. So a, a benzene with an OH is called phenol. So it's going to be something phenol. So I'm going to go ahead and write phenol. But what else do I have bonded? What is this group right here? CH2, CH3. Ethyl benzene. Well, remember, we're going to use phenol, okay? Since phenol takes care of the benzene and the OH group. So it's ethyl phenol, but we need to indicate if, if we just wrote ethyl phenol, we have no idea what the substitution pattern is. Like, are, are they connected in a 1 2 pattern or 1 3 or 1 4? It's M for meta. Yeah, it's meta. meta. For meta. That's right. Now, you could also write 1 3 ethyl phenol, and I would not count you wrong. Okay, so if the numbering is easier for you, but you do need to know what M, O, and P means in case you see that on exam. So it's M, it should be lowercase by the way, M ethyl phenol. Okay, what about this next one, B? The CH3 has a name, is it? It's the T, it starts with a T, I don't know how to say it. Toluene. Yes. Yep, that's the first one, toluene. Okay, so we'll just go ahead and write toluene. And what else should I add to that, Abby? Um, it should also be an M, right? It is M. Okay. M. Okay, but what about the other group? How do I name that? This CL right here. It's like chlorine. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. <laughs> it's a group, instead of writing out chlorine, you write chloro. Chromo, chloro, fluoro. Okay, so does she. So M chloro toluene. And that's exactly what we saw up here too. Remember when we wrote out structure for A, it was M chloro nitro benzene. So when you have a halogen atom bonded on there as a substituent group, um, you cut off the I and E and the name ending for that group is O, so chloro. Okay, what about C? What do y'all think? Is that a benzene? This is benzene in the middle. Uh huh. So it's going to be benzene is the parent name, but we need to talk about the substituents and the substitution pattern. So what group is this right here? This group right here. You're looking at the line structure. Sometimes it can seem sometimes it can seem a little harder to name, but this is this is a carbon, and this is a carbon as well. So we have a two carbon group attached. So what what do we name that group? That substituent group? Is it ethyl? Ethyl. Okay, and then what's this other group? Isopropyl. That is isopropyl. That's a three carbon group, just like up here earlier. That's this right here. And we're attaching three carbons and it's attached to the benzene ring through the middle carbon. Same thing, it's just shown to you in the line structure form, okay? And so we gotta put them in alphabetical order. So we have, meth we have ethyl and isopropyl. So which one goes first alphabetically? Isopropyl. Isopropyl, 
all one word here. But we got to indicate what the substitution pattern is. Is it ortho, meta, or para? Remember, ortho's one, two, meta, one, three, para, one, four. Meta. It is meta. So we'll just do a lowercase m. So meta isopropyl ethyl benzene. Wait, I'm confused. Why did isopropyl go before ethyl? Oh, I was thinking methyl in my head for some reason. Okay. <laughs> All right, I did that. It'd be ethyl, then isopropyl. I, I was like M, I was thinking M for meta. And then somehow that got put on my ethyl isopropyl benzene. There we go. Okay, so on the exam, you're gonna have to name a lot of coffee. You're gonna have to name a lot of stuff, okay? Um, and then we have gotten in a little bit deeper into reactions today. Yesterday, we didn't talk about a whole, what is the one kind of reaction we talked about with alkanes yesterday? Anybody? Is it combustion? Combustion, that was all we talked about. And honestly, you cover that pretty well in 1402. Combustion should be a familiar term. So we got into several different kinds of reactions. So today you need to spend some time after you take a break. We're going to do lab here in a second, um, but come back to some of this in a little bit. Where is it? Okay, all these hydro hydrogenation, halogenation, um, and hydration. All those words sound really similar and they can be really easy to confuse. The way it helps me to keep it straight is to remember the root word, hydration, okay, water. Okay, hydrogenation, hydrogen. Halogenation, we're adding halogens to our compound, okay? And then beyond that, these are all just addition, remember? There's other kinds besides addition, and we practiced identifying what is an addition, what is an elimination, what is a substitution, okay? And you're gonna have to definitely differentiate between these on the exam. And it will be stuff similar to this, okay? I, I'm, I'm gonna ask you questions formatted similar to this as best I can for the exam, okay? But practicing the ones in the textbook as well will help get you familiar with other formatted styles of questions on the same content. So here's what I'll say. If you uh, have not done the practice problems from chapter 12, like the recommended ones from the textbook, I mean the ones even in addition to the homework, then I, I think you're somewhat a little bit behind. Uh, I really, really beg you all not to let things pile up. Don't save it all for the weekend because I'm not going to be there to help answer questions. And I promise you're going to run into questions. So please spend some time today. If you have not done the recommended problems from chapter 12 and the problems on the homework from chapter 12, now we also have the problems from chapter 13 to add to that. Okay. Um, but let's jump over to, we need grab the PDF for lab. If you have any questions on any of this stuff, I am going to host office hour from 2.30 to 3.30 today. 